Now, before we get into the U.S., we'd like to remind you, please like, share, subscribe. You know, your, your support is appreciated. So as we start to get into inflation, uh, you know, what is happening on some of the leading indicators, you know, we got a lot of Fed data that's, that's both leading and, uh, and current indicators of where things are progressing. We just wanted to show this chart, and we'll, we'll reference it uh, back in the next segment as well, where U.S. Uh, CPI, primary and owner's equivalent rent, or 40 to 43% of core CPI is uh, currently right at that low. And then when you look at the apartment rent for recent movers or apartment list, which leads by about five months, you get an idea of just how high that is and why we think there's going to be a lot of strength in, in terms of this inflationary push. And it's going to be on the back of rents normalizing a lot of these uh, new functions, uh, and again, new numbers getting baked into the system. <clears throat> so on the positive side, we wanted to look at when you look at Citibank uh, surprise index. So we actually had a bit of a reversal. You know, things got uh, people, the estimates were a bit lower. Things came in a bit better. You know, some of that uh, is, is, is specific re uh, regions, uh, durable goods and retail sales are the two biggest that were a good surprise to the upside. On the leading indicator side, on the PMI side, it was a surprise to the downside. So right now, again, nothing goes down in a straight line. You'll, you'll get it right. You'll get it wrong. And, but realistically, the trend still remains intact where things are, are getting a bit worse, not better. And, and again, we're still going to have growth. We're still going to have, it's just what are, what is the street expecting? And then what is actually happening? So again, there's always two things, just like I, as I talk in the EIA show, there's the physical market, there's the futures market, you know, this, there's the market, and then there's the economy. And the economy is just not at the level that the, uh, that the underlying market thinks it's at, which is something that we're going to go through in a bit more detail here. So now when we look at the, uh, uh, the, the trade deficits, so the August trade deficit widened to $87.6 billion versus the estimate of $87.3 billion, and uh, last month was $86.4. So imports were up 0.8%, while exports were up only 0.7%. August wholesale inventories were at 1.2% versus the prior 0.6%, uh, 06, and retail inventories of 0.1% versus 0.4%. So again... Uh, we still have tr the trade balance at, at near all-time lows. We're still trying to import. If you just look at the coast and just count the boats, there's a lot more imports to come. So again, you're just going to continue to see us stay at these low levels as we continue to try to import. And, and the reason why is, again, we've exported our supply chain, which means that we have to import a significant amount of either semi-finished or fully finished goods in order to uh, to supply our 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 stores, our, you know, our stocks, our, our stock shelves, our inventory in general. So again, keeping that pressure there. So then looking ahead. So this is just going to look ahead. So uh, to the next two years, have you become more positive or more negative about global growth? And then when you look at it in general, from July to September, people have gotten slightly more negative. And, uh, and that's where you, you're seeing some of the shift in terms of, well, you know, things are starting to get a little dicey. And Delta has been an excuse, and, and, and don't get me wrong, there was impacts from Delta. I'm not saying there wasn't. It's just they weren't as bad as people were expecting, but yet things have not come back to where they, where they need to be, and, and the reason why is because there's a lot of problems in the underlying economy that continue to crop up, and these landmines that have been ignored or at least papered over with you know $1.4 trillion in RRP, just to, as one example. So then what shape is the global, global recovery most likely to take? And now you've had a much, um, uh, a little bit of a shift, but into a U shape in terms of July versus uh, September, but you still have a significant amount of people that believe it's an incomplete V shape where you get that kind of bounce, strong bounce. I would say the check or the, you know, the kind of that swoosh mark in terms of uh, Nike, you know, that's where I think the, the expectations still remain. But with that being said, financial conditions are still easy, despite they, they have gotten a little bit tighter. But when you look at it, they're still some of the easiest uh, in, in history, you know, as uh, they're, they're right back to the levels that we've been at at the low ends of 2003, 2011. We're off the lows that we saw in 85 and 09, but still staying at a, at a very comfortable level. So it's not hard to get, fi uh, you know, financial conditions, get approvals and to get that. But 
when you look at why, well, let's look at the uh, 80 people took um, the, uh, the Fed up on their reverse repo facility coming in at a nice cool uh, $1.418 trillion. So our view was that we were going to get above $1.5 trillion by tomorrow, uh, which is a month end and quarter end, which is when you typically see some of these spikes. So before we get to 2021, when you look through 14 through 8 uh, through 17, all of those big spikes came on month end or quarter end or year end. But now we've, we've shaken all normalcy and here we are with this huge spike higher. Now, for those that have been paying attention, uh, the 10-year break-even inflation rate uh, has, has been fairly fixed in terms of where inflation is, but the generic uh, government 10-year has started to creep higher, which is, again, pulling that yield on the uh, 10-year Treasury protected securities up. Uh, we still believe that we'll get to about 2% as we continue to see this grind up. Uh, as inflation you know, is, becomes less transitory, we, we move much further into uh, a potential, uh, you know, default, or you know, the debt ceiling becomes an issue as it becomes that political, you know, play card that everyone likes to play with. Which is why we do believe that we're going to get that ten-year that's going to go much, uh, you know, up another call it forty basis points over the coming few months. And it's not just the ten-year. When you look at the, that the break evens, we had this strong move off of the lows from twenty twenty. Then you had this big breakout in February, and then you've kind of gone sideways and you flagged out. And one of the things that I I, I think we're, we're kind of setting up for the next leg up when you, when you look at where this inflation push is, where these real rates are going to go as we head into that raising rate cycle. We did have an increase in purchases from in the international world as they look to try to uh, protect their currencies. You know, the U.S. dollar continues to strengthen. And for those that watch the USD dynamic show, I'll post it again in the comments. But we think the U.S. dollar survives this round. It's just Again, you're going to see the dollar strengthen. As the dollar strengthens, it's going to put more pressure on emerging markets who have a significant amount of emerging market debt, and then that's going to create additional pain at the uh, country level. Now, with that being said, again, kind of looking at Fed easy money, where things are, well, the LBO boom fueled by easy money and possible hikes in capital gains taxes, sweeping Wall Street deals, making, uh, making to highs not seen since before the, uh, the financial crisis. So we're back to levels that we saw in 2007, and we all know what happened in 2008 and then proceeded into 2009. So buyout loans uh, through first nine months of each year. <coughs> you can see that we're we're running red hot and we're running headlong into that wall. So when you uh, the other thing that's coming to pass now is uh, the U.S. Uh, the total number of antitrust enforce, enforcement cases. So we used to say that people were getting or the government was getting lazy and didn't want to have to look too hard at all this, but now you're starting to get this this pivot and. We, we liken it back to the robber barons, where when you look at what the robber barons became, they were vertically integrated, and they created significant efficiency, whether that be, uh, you know, gasoline and diesel to move the world, uh, to, to move goods, uh, steel to carry heavier goods, railroads to connect the, um, the U.S., like, essentially, all of these things just created a significant amount of efficiency but the biggest purse won, and you could buy out your your uh, your um, uh, competitors. You could vertically integrate, and when you look at what's happened with Google, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, they've cr they've done things very similar in terms of efficiencies and efficiency gains and vertical integration, but. At what point is it too much? And that's where I think you're starting to see some of this pivot of, well, should we really be let them buy that? You know, what what you know sh what should you spin off in order to purchase that? So I think you're getting a lot of uh, additional cases that are being opened about that. So then when you look at dividends funded by U.S. leveraged loans. Uh, when you look at where we are for 1Q versus 3Q, we're at the highest level we've been at since uh, since essentially 2013, 2014. As debt is cheap, so let's just uh, go out, get a leveraged loan, and use that to pay dividends, which again becomes a much bigger issue on the back end. So now when we look at the conference board U.S. leading index, uh, 10 economic indicators, uh, it continues to climb and is now well above its pre-pandemic level. And year-over-year -year growth, which is that bottom piece, is rolling over but still remains strong. Strong at 10 percent, uh, plus 10 percent, still higher than in the aftermath of the G of the uh, financial crisis. So you're still seeing some 
spurts of growth. And that's why it's, you know, <laughs> when you look at the U.S., you can pick the bullish or bearish side. Like there's enough for everybody to, to, be, uh, to be happy in their little echo chamber. Obviously, the prices ind- indicate you want to be bullish. So, you know, that's, that's the, the negative side on, on that echo chamber and the, and the bearish side. But you have to respect what is driving, what is leading, uh, how much of this is going to kind of continue to drive forward, or are we going to see additional pressures? And that's when we start looking at some of the internal. So the conference board consumer confidence expected at 150 came in at 109. Uh, consumer expectations came in at the lowest point since 2020, since they're back to the lows of, uh, of, the, of the pandemic, which again, just leads to what the expectations are. What is the view going forward? And that's, it continues to weaken as you're seeing inflation. You know, people who had all this money in, in savings is now been dwindled down. Now you're, you're, uh, you know, your wages haven't gone up where you wish they would, or they haven't gone up at all as your costs continue to rise, which again, continues to create this, uh, this, this, uh, this friction. And then when you look at the flash IHS market, uh, PMI manufacturing at 55.2 in September versus 56.7 in August services at 54.4 versus 55.1, putting the composite at 54.5 versus 55.4, which is a 12 month low overall upturn weighed uh, way down by services sector as ongoing virus restrictions. So you're seeing, again, this continued slowdown in, in just the, <clears throat> the economy and, and just the way things are going. Now, mind you, above 50 is still growth. So we're still growing. It's just the pace of that growth continues to slow down and continues to weigh on where things are going, where things are at the moment. And I just want to pull up to see Estimates. So estimates for manufacturing were 61. You know, they uh, they came in at 60.5. You know, then as we said here, services estimate was for 54.9, came in at 54.4. So you're just seeing this this slowdown that's accelerating, and it's still more than expectations as the pressure continues to rise across the manufacturing space. And that's when you then look at six-month employment outlook index continued to weaken. So again, there's expecting more jobs, expecting less jobs. You're starting to see this softness that's creeping in. And it's before it could be ignored, but you're starting to get to a point where I think people or, you know, Algos or Watson is starting to wake up to some of the momentum shifts that are happening in the market. Now, I thought this was a good quote from Chris Williamson, the chief business economist at IHS. The pace of U.S. economic growth cooled further in September, having soared in the second quarter, reflecting a combination of peak demand, supply chain delays, and labor shortages. The slowdown was led by a a cooling of demand in the service sector, linked in part to the Delta variant. However, while manufacturers have, have seen far more resilient demand, factories face growing problems in sourcing enough supplies and labor to meet orders. Supply chain delays show no signs of easing with another near record lengthening of delivery times in September. Hence, factory output growth also weakened and order backlogs rose at a record pace in September. The upshot is yet another month of sharply rising prices charged for goods and services as demand outpaces supply and higher costs are passed on to consumers. So then this just breaking that out, here's where you have the, the, the delivery times. They haven't gotten worse, but they haven't gotten better. Again, moving sideways as output prices continue to push up. And at what point does the consumer reject them, which is something that we've talked about. And I think we are starting to see it as some consumers are balking. So then when you look at the Chicago Fed National uh, Activity Index weaker in August down to 0.29 versus the 0.5 estimate, and 0.75 in prior months, uh, you know, revised up. Production-related indicators contributed 0.11 to headline, down from 0.4 in July. Employment-related indicators added 0.12, down from 0.38. So again, all of them are still positive, but again, just that slowing down. You're seeing this deceleration, which is putting some of those headwinds going forward. Now, now shifting over to Dallas, Dallas Fed manufacturing weaker in September at 4.6 uh, versus 11 estimate and nine in the prior month. Outlook turned negative uh, along with softer, but still expanding new orders in CapEx. Employment, shipments, production, all and prices paid all increased. So again, the employee side getting a bit better. That's a positive, but prices paid continues to go up, which is why when we look at debt, prices paid had a little bit of a dip right back up. Prices received a little bit of a dip now higher than where it was. Prices paid is back to the high, 
where prices received is now above the high. And that's where we continue to see these pressure points and the underlying issues when you look at how much is getting passed through. <clears throat> and again, speaking to the strength of the consumer and what is being called upon them to maintain their, their normal lives, if you will, while new orders fell and growth rate of orders also fell. And so you're seeing, now this is projecting further out, where you're seeing some of these slowdowns, which is, remember, when you look at the six-month surveys, all of them are getting a bit worse, and it's because they're seeing it in their jobs. They're seeing it at the factory. They're seeing this overall adjustment uh, lower, which, again, is putting some of these headwinds in place. With the Dallas Fed manufacturing outlook change, you can see it's now negative 2.8. So manufacturing uh, component has turned negative for the first time since May 2020. So again, this is just showing now we're, we're actually not even just just growing but slowly now we're actually contracting and and I think you're going to start seeing some of these negative uh the these negative levels start coming through and now Kansas City prices paid year over year yep guess where it is it's at those highs and it's the highest uh, the highest possible reading is 100 and it it ticked 100 so give you an idea of kind of where things sit and now looking into Richmond the survey was for 10 the actual in September was negative 3 so Richmond Fed man, uh, manufacturing new orders were expected to be, uh, you know, are actually negative 20. So you're seeing the deceleration. Now, now we're coming out of something showing some growth, but positive. Now we're actually seeing detraction. And that's when you start looking at where are we sitting as we go forward. And let's look at prices paid. While all of this is happening on the negative side, prices paid, new all-time high. Prices received, just off the highs. But still, like you can see the, uh, earlier this year, a little downtick, then an explosion higher. Again, as you look at prices paid, they're going to try to continue to move that down as much as possible. And then when you start looking at the consumer confidence, so consumer confidence index fell 5.9 points to 109.3 in September on virus fatigue and labor and inflation concerns coming to a seven month low. Current conditions were down 5.5 points to 143, expectations down 6.2 points to 96.6. Spread of the Delta variant continued to dampen optimism. But when you look at consumer spending on back to school retail, if you received the tax, the, the, the child tax credit, you spent more and versus didn't receive. So again, this is that last bump that we were talking about, especially when you look at July, because remember you had that revision up when you looked at July versus August, because you had a surprise to the upside based on how strong that purchasing was for that child tax credit, which is starting to abate and come down, which again is going to kind of dampen some of that going forward. But then looking at the spend at back to school retailers, online continues to be strong versus in store, where you still had both. Uh, you, you know, when you look at received child tax credit, people were more apt to spend. Again, kind of just proving out what we just showed earlier as we continue forward. But a lot of that is starting to slow down, which again is going to put some of those uh, damp in some of that consumer goods and retail sales in terms of just purchasing. So now that we've gone through that, we want to go a bit deeper to, well, how are people purchasing? With what money? And look at what the income and wage situation is on an aggregate as well as through the different quartiles that we continue to talk about.